Okay, thank you. So we're now going to hear from Lindsay Gillespie, who is Deputy Head of Public Services, the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland and Project Manager on Making the Future Women in Archives. Um, and she's going to speak on, in her words, Women in Pronies Archives. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, thank you very much to me from the Royal Irish Academy for having me here today. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, two projects that we did at Prony, um, and I've named it in her words and it's very much about um, us trying to find women's collections within Prony um, that people haven't really looked at or talked about before um, and use women of today to bring those voices back out into the light. So. Um, Everything that I'm talking about was um, a specifically funded project at Prony called Making the Future. Um, it had lots of diff different strands. It was a partnership project between Prony um, as the official archive for Northern Ireland, um, National Museums Northern Ireland, the Lynn Hall Library is Belfast's oldest library, and a place called the Nerve Centre, which is a creative um, engagement centre um, in the northwest. Um, we were funded under the EU's PEACE 4 programme. For anybody that doesn't know, PEACE funding has been around in Northern Ireland for more than 20 years. Um, we thought PEACE 4 might be the end. We've got one more round to go. Unfortunately, Brexit is putting, putting the brakes on a lot of that kind of stuff, but um, we were really grateful to get so much funding to do these projects. Um, and essentially, it was about community engagement with our heritage. Um, and it's called Making the Future because what we were trying to do was look at our past to see how we've got to where we are now and how we can build a powerful vision for the future with all the diverse communities of Northern Ireland. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know what Prony is, um, just before I get started, we are the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. We were established in 1923, so we've been celebrating our centenary all year. Um, and we are a combination of official government records and privately deposited archives. And at the minute, we're holding about three and a half million records in our care. Um, and obviously, as we move into the future, we have um, been bringing in audiovisual archives recently, and the Making the Future project itself has created a number of new archives at Prony as well. So the Making the Future project had lots of different th um, themes and strands, um, and for each partner in the project was responsible for different ones. Um, and the three that Prony was responsible for were 100 shared stories, an, an oral archive on participants for Making the Future, and then Women in the Archives, which is what I'm here to talk about today. Um, and as I said, for Women in the Archives, we really wanted to delve into the stories that were held within Prony that told women's stories um, as much as possible in their own words. Um, and it was all three community engagements, so we did nothing on our own. It was all with com community participants. Um, we had three exhibitions, a programme of events, and a number of community engagement programmes. We had more than 400 participants across our community engagement programmes for Women in the Archives, aged from just eight up to 93, which was great. Um, they were across community, we got some, we targeted specific groups, other times community groups and women's centres came to us, other times we just did open calls through Pony, Pony social media to get people involved with what we were doing. Um, what I will say is that 96% of our participants were women. It wasn't limited to women, but we only really got women. Um, and that just shows you who believes women's history is important. Um, we did have a few brave and enthusiastic men get involved with us. And when we looked at kids, the balance was much better, actually. And that's why it's at 96 and not like 99. Um, but in general, our participants were women. Um, so I was the creator for this project. So I suppose I got to focus on things that interest me personally, uh, which is great. Um, and my favorite sort of archival document has always been um, letters and diaries. I've worked in Prony for 11 years now. And for the first five years of my career, I worked in our private records department and I absolutely loved diaries and letters. I was a very slow cataloger because I like to read everything from start to finish rather than just, oh, this is this. Um, so I really wanted to use letters and diaries because I knew there was a lot of them in our collections that were written by women. So we were getting it in their own words. We weren't trying to tell their story from something else. We were hearing exactly what they wanted to say. So we used these specifically in two projects. In Her Words, which is an exhibition and community engagement program in 2019, and then Dear Diary, which was a community engagement program in 2020. So, um, letters and diaries, that's what we wanted to use. And as I said, we wanted to use it because it's, it's their own words and all we were gonna do was bring them into the light and let women tell their own stories. So within her words, as I began to curate an exhibition for this project, um, we were working with community engagement programs, our 
community engagement participants already um, and I had lots of discussions with them about what they might want to see in an exhibition about women's history and about women's words at Prune. Um, and one of the big things that come out from them is sort of this ordinary woman. We hear a lot about Lady This and Lady That and there was a lot, we'd had exhibitions before in Prony about Lady Londonderry and things like that and they were like, I don't really want to hear about that, I'd rather hear about somebody that might have represented my grandmother, my great grandmother, somebody in my own family history, just like an ordinary woman. So I thought, right, I'll look as hard as I can for them. Um, and that's sort of where we went with it, was women that you would have never heard of before. They were just women who had somehow made their way into our collections and we wanted to bring them to life. Um, and very importantly, that it was written in their own hand and in their own words, that they would have a variety of experiences. Um, we talked a lot about the limitations of finding women's voices. There's only certain women's voices we're ever going to be able to find, and there are some of them that are permanently lost to history that we will never find because of things like literary issues. They haven't had the time or the ability to write letters or keep diaries, so we, we don't have their words in the same way. Um, but also the benefit of having public and private records in one place in an institution like Prony, um, particularly for in her words. A lot of it came from private sources, but some of it did come from our official collections as well. And it just shows you if you look hard enough, you can't still actually find people's own personal voices inside official collections. So um, this is what our, in her words, exhibition looked like. Um, and again, these were just women I picked up, but we put their names huge at the top of the exhibition because they're not famous. Nobody had heard of them before. I wanted their names to be really, really big at the top. Um, and they were all sort of representative of different types of women. So the first one we had was Annie McKeown, who was an immigrant. And in Prony, we have got thousands and thousands and thousands of immigrant letters. You talked about the ordinary letter, and it's, it's such a fantastic way for us to hear from so many women about what it was like to up sticks and leave, knowing that you'd probably never come home, <laughs> to only have a letter to be able to write home. It would take weeks to go back and forth, so they're packed full of information, and they're packed full of emotion as well, because it's the only way to communicate. They didn't have zoom video calls anything like that to be able to, to talk to anybody at home um, what i also did for this um exhibition with the women we were working with at the time was get them to voice these letters and diaries so parts of them because i think you can read them and it's fantastic but if you hear someone speaking it with a little bit of emotion in there as well it just brings it to life on another level i'm hoping that these sound bites are going to work um, but you can just get a little snapshot of what they did My sound like I received your lovely gift in February. It was so kind of you to remember me in such a nice way. We left Pentwater late October for here, as we have not lived in Chicago for two years. My husband cannot stand the severe weather here. In March, we both came down with influenza. We lay in different rooms. I had a letter from Peggy, the details since last October, saying Uncle Nelson had passed away, but did not say of what. It is not so long ago, he wrote to my mother. I hope he left Peggy something. Okay, so that's just a little snapshot of what immigrant letters, and they're full of things. And I always think, I just imagine if you went from Ireland to like Chicago in the cold, and there's people who've gone to like Florida and the humidity, they're like, oh my, God, what is this? You know, and they can barely survive it. Um, and it's just really interesting to hear that in people's own words. Um, the next one is a lady called Mary Austin, um, and I really took to Mary Austin particularly. Um, and I found Mary Austin's letter in um, one of our official collection, so it's Prime Minister's correspondence. Um, and it was a lot of people writing to the Prime Minister in the early 1920s. Um, and Mary Austin's letter is really comprehensive. She gives so much information, she's so eloquent. Um, she represents mill workers, which there were a lot of in Belfast um, for a long time. Um, I'm going to let you listen to Mary's letter first, um, voiced by one of our participants. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I was able to find out from Mary outside of just this letter that she wrote. The enclosed paragraph inclined me to humbly appeal to you for a little help from public funds for a few weeks only until I am able to go back to my work. I have been suffering for months but only left my work in Jenny Mount Mills on the 10th of February. I went to Dr Wilson White Abbey and got certificates on the 12th and 19th of February for health insurance benefit but I only got six and eight the first week and ten shillings this week owing to arrears and stamps. White House Spinning Mill closed down on the 4th of February 1921 and remains closed and I did not get started until the following August 1921. Got no arrears card or inclination that I was in arrears. I am suffering agonies even while I write with an abscess on my neck and another terrible one on my shoulder. Dr Wilson very kindly gave me cod liver oil but I cannot take it without new milk and I cannot afford it. 
I must pay my rent and I am almost without a fire. I own three bags of coals in White Abbey and some bills to my grocer, but they can wait if you will be so kind as to send me a little immediate relief. If any gentleman or lady chooses to call, I will answer all inquiries truthfully. Perhaps you will not know to whom I refer, but W. McVicker, the retired leather merchant, late Anne Street or Church Lane, and W. McVicker, the boot and shoe merchant, Donegal Place, Mrs. Rob's late father, were both full cousins of my mother, Eliza McVicker. My sister is 73 and I 69 years of age. Friendless, helpless, and both suffering severely. Please excuse my troubling you at your present busy time. So that end apology gets me because so many of the women who write to the Prime Minister at this time apologise for bothering him. I'm really sorry to bother you, but you know, I'm having a really tough time. And what was included with Mary's letter was a little cutout from a newspaper that she'd seen that there were public funds to help people, and that's why she's writing to say, could she get some money from this? Um and she goes to great lengths to sort of like back up her character. You know, this person can fight for me, that person can fight for me. And um, you know, she says her sister's 73, she's 69, they're both still working at a time just as sort of mills were starting to go into decline, so there wasn't as much work around as there had been before. Um, I took a little look into Mary just to see if I could find any more information about her in our sort of standard family history research ways. Um, and I did find her on the census. Um, in both 1901 and 1911 um, and she had one point she was married and she had a son and um, that she was living with in 1901 um, I couldn't find her on the 1911 census and then obviously by the time she's writing here in 1922 it's just her and her sister and um, this is post the first world war so I don't know what happened to her husband what happened to her son but they've just been left on their own basically and they're still working you know really and in, in, they're getting on um, and they're still having to be responsible for themselves but she put a lot into her letter and um, she did get a reply and she did get a bit of money to help her which was great um, and I could see that from the collection as well but she just is representative of so many women's experiences across Belfast at this time. Um, Martha Barr is another, I'm not going to play hers because we could be here all day <laughs> with me playing these because I love every single one of them um, but Martha Barr again is another example of particularly post First World War, um, a lot of women in the position where their husbands had died or their husbands had got very badly injured and couldn't provide for them anymore there were limited opportunities for them to work. They had a lack of education before this, um, and a lot of them found themselves in the position of provider, um, but just all of a sudden, um, and again, found it very difficult. And Martha Barr had written to the Prime Minister as well um, about a widow's pension because she wasn't getting one because of just circumstances that had happened with her husband. Um, but she represented these women who just found themselves in this position. Um, Nan Watson is another one. Um, I would love someone to come along with a lot of money <laughs> and fully catalogue Nan Watson's collection and really bring Nan Watson to life because she's a fantastic, amazing woman. She was one of the first qualified doctors um, to come out of Queen's University in Belfast, female doctors to come out of Queen's University in Belfast. Um, she was um, a doctor in the army during the Second World War. She was from just from East Belfast. Um, she took tons of photographs. She was really into photography, so there are endless photographs in her collection and um, she wrote a lot of letters back and forth to her mother um, which we had out of her collection as well but she lived a really fascinating life and she kept everything she was a real hoarder which is why our collection is humongous and it has never been fully catalogued yet um, but you know as an archivist we love a hoarder and um, she kept everything everyone she treated during her time um, in the second world war she has a record of it and it's in her collection and um, again a really amazing woman that pretty much nobody has ever heard of um, but we have her whole collection and she's really interesting and then finally, this was the one that we decided to use um, from our Cara Friend collection. So Cara Friend was a befriending organisation set up in Belfast in the early 1970s um, for people, um, gay men, lesbian women or bisexuals. Um, again, the collection is very male focused because it's very focused on pre-decriminalisation. Um, so a lot of men are contacting the organisation because they're terrified or, or because they have been arrested. Um, there's not that much representation from women in the collection as there is from men, but there was a lesbian line at the time. So they do have some um, letters from women and some call notes of calls that they would have gotten from women as well. Um, because just because it wasn't illegal to be a lesbian obviously doesn't mean that it was accepted in, in Belfast in the, the 70s and the 80s. Um, so these were letters that were written to Kyra Friends. They're all completely anonymous. The entire collection is anonymized anyway. All of the names have been cut off it. Um, before it was ever given to Prony, um, 
It was closed at Prony for a long time. It's recently been recatalogued and anything that can be open is open. There's some really powerful stories in this um, entire collection that certainly need to be heard, but balanced up with, you know, allowing people to have their privacy and, and, and not giving anything away that anybody wouldn't want to know. Um, but I will play you this one because it's particularly powerful. Dear sir or madam, over the past couple of years, I have found myself attracted to other girls. I know this is not a phase I'm going through as I've tried to go out with fellas, but I don't have any feelings towards them. I've never been able to approach other girls or talk to anybody as they would probably be shocked and appalled. I brought the subject up in front of my parents and they thought that homosexuals should be shot so I decided not to tell them that I was. I've nobody to talk to about my problem, and sometimes I get that frustrated and lonely. I just want to be dead. I've tried to do that and couldn't even do it properly. I heard about Cara Friend about three months ago when some friends were casually talking. I found out your address, and believe it or believe it not, I have wrote about eight times since I got your address. But this time, the depression is really bad. And if I don't get help, there's no saying what I will do. I'd better sign off now, as my mum and dad are due home. Yours faithfully. So again, this is just the voice of one woman to represent many um, at a very difficult time, probably, to, to be living in Belfast and Northern Ireland in Ireland in general um, and it was something that we felt very strongly about including and since we have included it the collection has been re-looked at, the collection has been opened up as much as it can be which I think is a really positive um, thing to come out of our, our exhibition. So that's just a few of the, the women that were included in the exhibition. The women that were included in the exhibition were just a few of the ones that I had brought out and um, as everyone who's ever been a curator knows it's like a labour of love and heartbreak you find all of these stories, you want to include them all, but you can't. Um, and certainly our community participants were the ones who sort of helped me narrow it down. We, we practiced lots, we read lots, they recorded lots, and we really just saw what resonated with the women of today, and that was what was included in the exhibition. The second one I'm going to talk about is Dear Diary, which was a community engagement program then that we did in 2020. It was our final in-person one before COVID hit, and then everything was online for two years after that. Um, but again, this was sort of like leading on from in her words, and diaries and sort of the connections that people can build when they're able to immerse themselves in someone's history in their own words. So I pulled together 17 diaries from Pony's collections spanning between 1798 and 1981. Um, and then we brought together 17 women to take on a diary, read the whole thing, pull quotes out of it, tell us about the woman, what did you learn, who was she, what was important about her. And yes, to give us quotes that we could build a sort of little timeline of women's history from these diaries online. So that's what we attempted to do. I think we did a pretty good job. I wish we'd had like two years to do it instead of two months, um, but we did what we could. Um, so our oldest diary was um, from 1798, so um, the United Irishmen Rebellions um, from Elizabeth Richards. Um, and again, I hear lots of people say there's not very much about women at this time, and there isn't, but we do have this in Prony. Um, so what we did was, as I said, each woman got the diary, read it from front to back, pulled out quotes, we were asking for a minimum of 12, but some people you know, had like 50, um, because there's so many interesting things that these women are saying. Um, to keep it fair, when we started with this, um, there's so many interesting diaries and all of the women that were coming to do it. Um, I just set the diaries on tables in our reading room and told them to go in and sit down, and wherever they sat down, that was their woman. Pick up that diary and go with it. And it is amazing how many people ended up with some kind of personal connection to the woman that they had just sat down in front of. Um, but I think it just shows you, if you spend a lot of time engaging yourself in an archival collection belonging to someone, you'll find something that connects you to them. Um, so this is a quote that was pulled from Elizabeth Richards, um, 1798 diary. So some of our work people and servants took leave off as they are going to the rebel camp at Lacken. Some of them go reluctantly, this is the age of wonders. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of quotes. <laughs> um, so I really love this one. Did I skip someone out? Yeah, JP Smile. So again, the diaries were all lots of different women. Some of them were more affluent. Maybe some of them we, were women that people had heard of before, whose diaries had been looked at you know, heavily before. Um, and some of them were diaries that had never been looked at until we started this project. Um, and JP Smiles is one of these. Um, 
she was a young girl she was on a family trip to switzerland and this is her diary it's really beautiful she has lots of pictures in there and she does illustrations her writing is beautiful um, and again it's just really interesting to see her perspective of switzerland at that time um, our next one is a really interesting one so this is una i can't say her middle name Gina Kanda Haldian, um, born in Tyrone, um, but was living in Italy during the Second World War. So she had lots and lots of stuff to say about the war in Italy. A really interesting woman, but this is her quote, <laughs> one of the quotes that was picked. Um, uh, she was very passionate about hot water bottles um, <laughs> and cups of tea. And she could never get a decent cup of tea in Italy, and it really annoyed her. And she talked about it a lot in her diary. Um, but she also helped soldiers get out of Italy during the Second World War. There are letters in another collection about her and her help to these soldiers that um, Bruna, who was looking at this diary, was able to find. Bruna has since got in contact with Una's great nephew, um, whose mother remembers her, has a lot more stories to tell us about her. So we're going to hopefully take Una a little bit further um, in the future. Then we looked at Eva Chichester, she was a woman from Newcastle and County Down, um, like a Sunday school teacher, she was reasonably middle class, did a lot of travelling, had an obsession with photography, again similar to Nan Watson, bit of a hoarder, her collection is huge, it's brilliant, but why I really wanted to have her on today is because her one of her diaries made it into our Prony Treasures collections and it is her recollection of the 1916 Easter Rising here in Dublin. So she decided that she was coming to Dublin for a bit of a holiday with her friends, we girls trip, and they get down to Dublin, and then she calls it the Sinn Féin Rebellion, what we now know as Easter Rising kicks off, and she is furious, furious <laughs> that all of her plans have been upended, and what these Sinn Féiners are doing. So um, she writes a diary about it, and I'm just going to play you, seeing as we're here in Dublin, um, some extracts from that. I want to make an effort to write an account of these last six terrible days because I think we shall be glad afterwards to have done so. I write now in a lovely April morning and on what should be a peaceful, quiet Sunday. But alas, instead of church bells all around us, there is the unceasing crackle of rifles. Surely it is the strangest Sunday we ever spent. Got a little bit more. More than one person did Eva's diary. We three ladies came up to Dublin on Tuesday, April 18th, for a month. Having made many plans for shopping, attending concerts and meetings, going to the Irish Church Synod and meeting friends. Needless to say, these plans were never carried out. The first hint of anything unusual came on the morning of Easter Monday, April 24th, when I went round to Baggett Street about some rooms. The landlady there mentioned that the Sinn Feiners, pronounced Sinn Feiners, were to meet that day. Anne and I were just going out having a vague idea of exploring Trinity College on chance of the library being open. But as we know that whenever there is a row in Dublin, it is generally near the college. We began thinking that a bank holiday after all was not a very good day to go and that we would take a walk at Stephen's Green instead. <laughs> very very disappointed and she does write in it like phonetically Sinn Feiners just in case in the future no one would know what she was talking about just in case she she put that in there but her her diary it is just it's such a different very personal perspective on on the Easter Rising and it's just the first time I read it I was blown away and um, it's one of my favorite documents and um, I'll just go through these last two very quickly so we did have Roberta Hewitt who is the wife of John Hewitt very very famous poet um, who has, they, we have a personal collection from John and Roberta Hewitt in our collections at Prony. Nobody has ever really looked at the Roberta parts of it before. She kept two very comprehensive diaries um, and we have since done a much larger um, community engagement program on Roberta herself. Um, her diaries have been transcribed from start to finish by a group of volunteers um, and we made a short sort of animated film about her as well and her life. Um, we reached out to the John Hewitt Society and we were doing that one to get them to come and give us a talk and they were like, ah, oh, didn't really know that much about Roberta. Oh, really? Her diaries are brilliant. Yes. <laughs> she was a very interesting woman, and it's very obvious from the collection that if there had been no Roberta Hewitt, there would have been no John Hewitt. Um, she was very much amused for his work um, and a, a huge supporter of his work um, and a very interesting woman in her own right. And then finally, this woman, Bruno McTasney, is the one that kind of kicked it off for all of us. I have followed her on Twitter, whatever it's called these days, um, for a long time. She is uh, at Northern Iron Girl in 1981. She's closed it on Twitter now, it's now on Facebook. 
but she had a diary of her 13 year old self in 1981 in Uri during the Troubles. And then she tweets quotes out of it every single day. So now she does it on Facebook. So this, I found her initially whenever I started this project. She came to the launch of our project. She gave her diary to Prony. Thank you very much. And uh, she was part of this project as well. Um, and her diary is brilliant and really, really interesting. Um, I'll skip over if you do want to visit Prony. We're open to the public all the time. Uh, it's totally free. Um, so. Um, those are just two projects that we've done through the Funded Making the Future project. Um, we hope to be able to do more in the future, and as I said, some of them have gone on to be larger projects on their own, looking at specific women or specific parts of our collections. Um, but very much what we've been talking to, not just women about, but people in general, is about um, the future of archives and the future of our voices and making sure that they are in there. Um, what I have shown you here is just a snapshot of what's held in Prony for women's history. And that is only a tiny, tiny percentage of the history of women on this, island, on, on this island. So much of it has been lost to history already. We will never get it back. But it's really important that what we do have, that we shine a light on it, and then we make sure the same thing doesn't happen in the future, that we don't lose our voices to history. Um, so thank you very much.